and we posted it on Facebook as well. So, okay, so let's get into the Akradim Bosom. Yeah. And we have been doing some revisions and some modifications as we've been um, having our classes, Dubaku Par 1 and Dubaku Par 2. So that put a little um, uh, delay on the release of volumes three and four, but they, they are coming. So, and then we're, we're working, we're gonna complete three, four, five, and six very soon. So, okay, so, yeah, both some ya, and you see her image, Wachet, she's also called Oya Nevejida in Yoruba as an Orisha, and in the Ebe and phone language in, as a Bodun and so forth. So you see, this is an image of Wachet in the female form, and her name Wachet, spelled with the watch plant, the papyrus plant. Um, the T is the concretizing feminine force and so forth. And Nebit, Tawi, means the mistress or masteress, chieftainess of the two lands. So. So, Yah is the Abosum of Chin Yah, which is Uranus. Her Da or Day is Yada, Thursday. Thursday is called Yada, but it's also called Yada. We mentioned in a previous um, class, there are two Adinkra dictionary or Adinkra books that have, you know, that are kind of go to books with regard to Adinkra symbols. One of them is the Adinkra dictionary by W. Bruce Willis. He has about 80 symbols. It's a good book. Then there's a book, Cloth as Metaphor by um, G. Um, Kojo Arthur uh, Fanti from Ghana. He has about 700 Adinkra symbols in the book. But in the beginning, when he's talking about the culture and the cosmology and, and, and so forth, he mentions Yada, but he also mentions Yada as a name for Thursday. So that's one of the references where you can find that at. But, uh, so it's Yao Dao with respect to, you know, Yao, divinity Yao, Heru, Ya Da with respect to Nana Ya. So she's referred to fierce attacker, relentlessly assailing disorder. Ya is the Abosom of fighting and punishment. Ya is an Abosom who is a protectress of royal sovereignty. Ya, along with her twin sister, Abba, governed the di divine magnetosphere a governmental structure is preserving stability within Abadie, within creation, the divine body of Nyamewa and Nyame, the Supreme Being, and thus the magnetosphere permeating Asase Afu, the Earth Mother, and the Afurakani, Afurakani, African Black Body. So we go into detail to, and we have to, of course, prove this. Um, hold on, I wanna make sure this is, uh, okay. We have to prove this and we do that in the article and in the work in general. Many Akanfo, Akan people on the continent, some of them are unaware of the deities governing the seven days of the week. They believe they're just named after days because of the corrupt influence of Christianity and Islam and white culture in general. They try to get away from any notion about both some of divinities and just focus on the fictional, you know, fake deity of the Bible or the Quran. But even for those who know that there are spirits, deities that are tutelary deities of each day of the week, and it's really the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern each day of the week, the assumption is, and when you look at those charts, you'll simply see Awusi, Ajo, Benna, Awuku, Yao, Afi, and Amen. And you'll see the seven. Uh, what we show, of course, is that there are 11. And we can prove that, and we've proven that. Um, first and foremost, we know who the other, the additional four are, which is Abena, which is Sekhmet. So it's not just Bena on Tuesday, Bena das Bena and Abena. You have Akua, which is, you know, Nebethet. We have Ya and Abba. Those are the four, Wachet and Nekebet, those are the four that they are unaware of. 
But when you actually look deeply within the culture, the language, the culture, cosmology, the praise names and so forth, you will find those references to these divinities. And when you look in the culture and know what you're looking for, even if they're talking about Anansi Sim, Anansi stories and so forth, if you know what you're looking for, you'll find references to these divinities. You'll even find a reference to Nyamewa, um, even when they're talking about, for example, there's a couple, two a two-part article series called um, The Soul of the Akan. They're talking about the Okra, the soul of Akan. The, the, the person's name is Samuel, Samuel Akesan, and I'll put that in the chat room. It's a Ghanaian who was writing back like in the 40s and 50s. And I'll get the name of the art, article, but it's talking about the soul, the concept of the soul, the Okra, in our kind of culture. But this is, you know, an academic writing. He got involved in Christianity, but he was still trying to write something about the tradition. Um, and then there was a, he wrote another couple of articles talking about the, the nature of a priest in the Akan tradition. And it was a lot of negativity because he's Christianized, so he's trying to say that, you know, they're charlatans, and when the person comes to get divination, he talks about how some of the priests, Okompo, who, and some of them will act as charlatans, but that's not the nature of the culture. But he's talking about some of the, the kind of things that they do, but in the beginning, just incidentally, the incidental evidence, he's talking about when the priest, the Okompo, is, you know, pouring libation and preparing you know, consultation for the person, but he's engaged in ritual prayer. And then he talks about, um, um, he's talking about Inyame, but then he also talks about, about um, Aberewa, the great elder's mother, and refers to as, refers to Inyame as the Okunu of Aberewa, talking about the husband of Aberewa. Meaning, Inyame has a wife, and of course that's Inyamewa. So just incidentally, he just glides past that. But the fact that you know he mentions the priest is mentioning in his prayer that Inyame is a husband, that means he has a wife. So who is the wife? Of course we know who she is because we know Inyame is Amen. We see images of Amenet. We know she exists, so she has to be in the culture. And you look in the language. Inyamewa means goddess. They reduce that name from Inyamewa to the great goddess. They'll try to say that Inyamewa is just a, a title for female abosum, just a term for goddess with a, you know, um, a lowercase g, which is totally inaccurate. They just want to pretend like there are no deities or there was just a, a one supreme being. But the fact that he mentioned there's a wife of, you know, or he, Inyame is the husband of someone, we know who she is. The fact that in one of the Anansi Sim, they talk about the mother of Inyokumpon, whose name is Insia. And they talk, there's a couple of stories where they talk about Insia, the mother of the sky god. And at some point, Insia, the mother of the sky god, died, and Anansi was trying to trick some people into certain things. And they talk about the various the story and all the different machinations Anansi went through. And they're more focused on the fact that Anansi was trying to trick people into getting something done. But what's most poignant for, for us is that in Yonkumpong, the creator has a mother and her name is Insia. And Insia is a place name for, for the number six. The six born is Insia. Like a second born is Menu, or the third born is Mienu, and so forth, and Mienza. The fourth born, if you know, like Kofi Annan, he was the UN Secretary General for a while. Kofi meaning he's born on Fida, Friday, connected to the Abosom Fi. But Annan means four. That means he was the fourth born. If somebody's fifth born, they're Enum. If they're sixth born, they are Insia. If they're ninth born, they're Nkrumah, like Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah means he was, you know, it's associated with ninth born, and Nkron is ninth, and so forth. So the thing is, um, the fact that Nyokumpon has a mother and she's the sixth born, when we look in the cosmology of ancient Kanadian Kemet, 
you have the primordial eight divinities. You have Amen, Amenet, Kai and Kayet, Hehu and Hehut, and Nun and Nonet. Now, Kai and Kayet are the first and second born. Hehu and Hehut are the third and fourth born. And Nun and Nonet are the fifth and sixth born. And Nun and Nonet in ancient Kanid and Kemet are the mother, they're the divine energy, the root energy of being within the black substance of space. They are the mother and father of Ra and Ra'ed. And in the text, they talk about Nonet is the mother of Ra. Nonet in ancient Kanid and Kemet is the sixth born of Amen and Amenet. So the sixth born child of Amen and Amenet is the mother of the creator, Ra. In the Akan culture, the sixth born Insia is the mother of Inyonkumpon. So when we know the cosmology of ancient Kemet, we can prove the cosmology in Akan that an Akan person will have no knowledge of any of that, that the same cosmology is laid out if you understand the cosmology of Kemet. But even if beyond just looking at linguistically or incidental evidence of some Ghanaian scholars writing about things and happening to mention certain things, even if they were unaware of the, the ramifications of what they're saying, proving that there's a creator and, and a creatress, that there's the creator is a child of someone, as we always say, the creator and creatress are actually grandchildren of the supreme being, which many people assume the supreme being and the creator and creatress is the same thing. So we can prove all of that, but first and foremost, when we learn about these divinities, it's through experience. Nana Yah comes forward and shows us who she is ritually through direct experience. She did that, Abena did that, Akua did that, Abba did that. So therefore we know who they are with a direct relationship with them. And then they direct us to information in Akan oral tradition, as well as the culture of Kanid and Kemet to prove it. And then they direct us to information in the Yoruba tradition, Ebbe tradition and so forth that corroborates the exact same spirit force in nature with the same similar titles and functions and so forth. So we can prove it all the way around. This is why the information we put forward, we're the first to put that information forward because no Ghanaian, no Akan person from the continent or anyone in the Western Hemisphere has been able to put this information together. So we can show, for example, she's connected to the planet Uranus. In Akan culture, when they, even the ones who know about this deities of the seven days of the week, those seven, they're dealing with the sun, moon, and five planets. And that's it. But those five planets, uh, you know, outside of Earth, we know Asase Afu and Asase Ya govern the Earth, you know, the Earth orb and so forth. But the five planets, but there are two more. Pluto is considered like a dwarf and not a true planet and so forth. But the other two planets are the great ice giants, which is Uranus and, you know, Neptune. But they would assume that our con people didn't understand, you know, the nature of those planets. So they didn't have any name for them or they weren't able to see them. Or, but that's totally inaccurate. The same with ancient Kanidika command. We can prove that through who these deities are and their sacred symbolism. So. Abosom Ya in Akan is Oya in Yoruba and Avejida in Vodun. Wachet in Knesset in Kemet, Nubi in Kemet. So the word Ya in the language has two major meanings. And we're going to pull this up in the Asante Fanti dictionary so you can see um, the relationship. And as we're pulling that up, the two major meanings to confront, to attack, you know, having to do with warfare, confrontation, to scold, to rebuke, um, and so forth, as we talked about with Yao, you know, in the previous week, um, and then Ya, meaning pain or affliction, synonym a Yao, pain or affliction. Now, let's look at it in the... Let's look at it in the Asante Fanti Dictionary because we want to see the relationship between the two. All 
All right, so. So first we see Yao here, meaning to abuse, shy, scold, to upbraid, revile, and sort of front. Um, abuse, scolding, upbraiding, or Yao. Um, Yao, meaning wild, fierce. The one who's wild, fierce, attacking, waging war, confrontational. A Yao is considered one who is confrontational, relentless, always attacking and so forth. Um, it's relentless in their attack. But then Ekiao also means pain, bodily distress, mental distress, but also one who brings pain. So that's Yao. But then when we talk about Ya, that's the feminine, you know, um, version of the name. So let's look at term Ya. Just so you can see the balance of male and female. This, this is how you can find, you know, even the corroboration within the language. So you see Ya here. It says Fanti equals Yao to revile, insult, rebuke, Ya, wild, fierce. And, you know, you'll see, of course, Yah is the um, proper name. Yahwa is a, um, another version of that name. So let's get back to the document. Okay. So those two different titles, to attack, to fight, Yao, confrontational, wild, fierce, but also pain, affliction, pain, misery, affliction. So you have the same two term, the same term with two different meanings. Then you have the same term with two different meanings, the same two different meanings in the Medutu, in the hieroglyphs, in the language of ancient Kemet. So if you have Ya, meaning to attack or fight, and Ya, meaning pain, misery, or affliction, and Akan, as the name of the divinity, then you have Ya, to attack, to fight, and Ya, meaning pain, misery, or affliction here. So the key here is even though it's spelled in the, um, the dictionary as A, what we find in the Coptic dialect, the term Aha or Eha in the Medutu are often pronounced as Ya or Ya. If you say Ya, you say Ya, Ya. So this read, the I sound becomes Ya. Yeah. So, for example, the term at as a spell meaning field or land, when you look in the Coptic dialect, it's E I R H A, as well as I A H, as you can see here. The Coptic dialect is the Late Kemet dialect, came into use at the end of the dynastic period about 2,000 years ago. So, you have um, E I. Iyoe, ya, yoi. So instead of at, it's yat, yat, especially here, I A H, which is yat. And this is why ya, ya, the same construction. It's not aha, it's ya, to attack, fight, ya, pain, misery, and so forth. So that's the proof. And of course, then we have the Ya in Akan is Yawa and Ayawa. Um, so that Ayawa, just like you have here, Ayai, you have two different versions. So in the late period, the Coptic era, you have that version. Earlier period, you have Ya and Ya and so forth. So it shows that we were still in Kemet when the Coptic period, you know, began and our people migrated after that period. So it gives a time stamp of when some of our people left because we still have that dialectical variant in our Khan language. Another example is the moon, often spelled at or at, but it's iat. And then in Coptic, it's written eo with an o, eo, eo in Coptic, and that becomes eo or jo in our Khan, and that's joda, Monday, the day of the jo, et jo, the moon. So, now, so we just 
show that just to give that corroboration linguistic. But what's most important is the name of the divinity is also carries the same meaning to attack, to fight, but also pain, misery, affliction, or one who brings that. Um, two different definitions for the same term in Akan, two diff definitions for the same term in ancient Kanita Kemet. Now, in the language of Kemet, the term watch, the root of watchet, means green. And we show that papyrus plant, um, she's the green one, the papyrus plant which makes up her name. As we can see here, this is the green papyrus plant of the north, just like you have the lotus plant, so-called lotus plant, sesh, or neked plant of the south. So this is watch, and then the T is watchet, and so forth. So, but what's important about that is She's the green one. The Ochin, the planet, Ya, when viewed from Asasea 4 from the Earth Mother, takes on a green or a bluish green color. Literally, we know which divinity um, is animating that planet. That's her name, the green one. So the papyrus plant is called Watch and forms of the scepter that Watch it takes into battle. It is also a symbol of sovereignty. The green papyrus plant is also the vendute that makes up her name along with the cobra. So you see the cobra and the watch plant and so forth. So she sits on the brow of the pair a, misnomer pharaoh with pair a, um, or encircling the aten, the sun, on the heads of certain abosom divinities as a rearing, fire spitting cobra poised to attack and kill the enemy. So you see Cobra and so forth, we show her here and her, her name spell, but then the winged serpent, but also her serpentine form in the body as the great serpent dealing with digestion. Because you'll see this winged serpent manifest in different ways. Now, 11 Akradin Bosom, the 11 major body systems. She governs the digestive system within the great divine body and the digestive system within the physical body. And we're gonna get into, um, so we, we show these different, um, the 11 major divinities and so forth, but the winged serpent references her role in the body is contributing to our magnetic field, that's where those wings come in through the electromagnetic energy of our life force. The serpent is her achinebwa, sacred animal totem. The digestive system is formed as a great serpent within the body. This is the structure entity through which we gather our fuel. The wings on the serpent reference the role of the lungs with, of course, the bronchial tubes and so forth, where the fanning of the fire of our life force energy through the breath occurs. So you have that serpentine wave of digestion is electric, you have an electric wave, and then the fanning of the fire in the lungs generates that magnetism. When we align with Nanaya, we align with the Abosom, the deity who governs the fuel and fire of digestion and the energy distribution or the continuity of our existence. 